Yeah, so uh, thanks, Raj, for the introduction. And uh, thanks, all of you, for coming. Um, special thanks to Ari, Raj, and Akshay, who invited me here and helped me coordinate my visit. Sadly, I think Akshay is not actually here. But <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks for all of your help with this. Um, so I'm excited to be here today. And uh, I'll be talking about, uh, so most of my research interests are in deep learning and specifically understanding properties of the kinds of representations that uh, deep networks learn and how they perform these computations. Um, and I'll be talking about uh, some, some of these insights that we've gained today. So, uh oh, oh no, <laughs> technical problems. Um, yeah, I think my clicker isn't working. Well, we will, okay, let's see if, Okay, so I will move manually and hopefully this all works. All right, so over the past several years now, uh, it's been hard to avoid the, the multitude of success stories uh, surrounding deep learning. And we've seen successes in areas of perception, such as object recognition, uh, speech recognition, uh, areas in language, uh, such as machine translation, uh, and even more recently, problems in robotics, such as robotic grasping. So there's a whole history of successes, uh, but in this, in this uh, long list of tasks that we've been uh, tackling with deep learning, maybe one task that stands out a little uh, in really being responsible for bringing deep learning back to the forefront of machine learning research is the uh, ImageNet classification challenge. Uh, the ImageNet classification challenge was a challenging computer vision task uh, where we have uh, millions of images and, and more than 1,000 object classes and we're trying to see if we can classify images and detect where in the images certain objects are. Now, before deep learning came about, uh, we'd uh, stagnated a little bit up here, um, somewhere between 25 to 30% error. And this all changed dramatically uh, with AlexNet in 2012. AlexNet was the first end-to-end -end convolutional neural network that was sort of uh, applied at scale to this problem, and it really blew all of its competitors out of the water and significantly reduced the error rate in this, in this task. And of course, shortly after AlexNet and over the years, we've seen uh, multiple variants of convolutional neural networks and, and other models uh, really keep chipping away at this error rate to uh, bring us down to, to where we are today. So in many ways, this task has been a resounding success for deep learning. It is a resounding success for, for deep learning. But one thing I'd like to draw your attention to is that as we develop more and more models to, to try and perform better at a task, the, the absolute performance gains we get tend to get smaller and smaller. And this is because it's, it's challenging to, to develop models uh, that consistently give you significant gains in performance in some of the complex tasks we're attempting. And really, many deep learning benchmarks have this sort of property. Uh, so this, this plot here is for the Stanford question answering data set. Uh, it's a data set uh, made for deep learning models to do end-to-end -end, uh, question answering. And again, we see the sort of pattern of we start off with maybe larger gains as we maybe start tackling some of the easier or lower hanging uh, fruit that, that leads to better performance in this task. Uh, and then we sometimes see a little bit of a plateau because it's just difficult to, to consistently come up uh, with, with new and more powerful architectures. Now, uh, looking back at this, this history of um, different architectures and, and how they perform, um, one, thing, one thing that becomes clear after a while is that Oftentimes, when new architectural innovations are introduced, be they new optimization methods or, or new layers, uh, sometimes the ones that are most influential and most useful for a vast group of researchers uh, come from some kind of heuristic insight about what kinds of computation the, the deep network is performing. And in these plots here, I uh, like to point out the, the residual network um, as an example of this, where the ResNet introduced uh, two, two variations compared to some of its, some of the previous models used in the ImageNet challenge, um, being batch normalization, which was discovered separately to the, the actual implementers of the residual network, uh, but was first incorporated in this architecture, um, and also residual connections, uh, both which have been innovations that have stayed with us and been very useful in, uh, in the, the years since then. 
And so overall, in the, in the field of deep learning today, uh, I think there's much more work to be done where we try and systematically analyze uh, some of the properties of, of the representations and the kinds of computations these networks are performing. And we can then use these insights to, to help guide practice, be it via training or, or uh, correct representation preprocessing and so forth. Um, and I'd as I'd mentioned, I think batch norm has been one, uh, one very important example of this. So in the talk today, I'd like to cover three pieces of work um, where we've looked at questions um, along this broad theme. Uh, the first part will be on expressivity, uh, how the structure of your uh, neural network architecture affects the kinds of functions that it can learn, uh, what this means for the internal representations, and some of the insights we can gain from this. Uh, the next part will be on learning dynamics, where we use uh, a tool from statistics, canonical correlation analysis, to see how these latent feature maps actually evolve over time. And finally, I'll touch a little bit on um, generalization in reinforcement learning, where we derive a, a new test bed where we know the optimal policy and optimal latent representations, and can really use this to probe and, and better understand what our reinforcement learning algorithms are doing. So, Neural network expressivity. Uh, so most of the, the work presented in this part of the talk is based on our uh, paper on the expressive power of deep neural networks that was at ICML last year. So neural network expressivity is, is a very fundamental question, um, a fundamental and a simple question. And the simple question is just, suppose we have a neural network and we're using this to represent some function. Well, what are the properties of, this, of these, these kinds of functions that can be represented by, by neural networks? And we can dig in a little further and also ask whether uh, there are certain architectural properties of our neural network, say the depth and width, uh, that result in differences in the kinds of functions we can approximate well with them. So this is a very fundamental question and it's attracted a lot of interest, both in the first wave of neural networks and in the, the second wave that we're seeing today. So in the first wave of neural networks, uh, probably uh, one theorem that's, that's worth mentioning is the universal approximation theorem. Uh, this theorem is jokingly also have said to have killed deep learning, but, <laughs> but the universal approximation theorem says that if we have a, a shallow neural network, so just one hidden layer, and it's big enough, uh, then we can approximate any continuous function uh, to arbitrary accuracy. Now this question of expressivity has also come back in this, this second wave of neural networks. Uh, and many of the works that have been addressing this question um, have focused on separating neural networks of different depths, uh, like so. So we might say, here's this class of functions that I can sort of exactly specify, and I can approximate these class of functions uh, arbitrarily accurately and efficiently with, say, neural networks of depth three. Uh, but if I try and use a neural network of depth two, then I'll need uh, a huge number of neurons, for example. But probably most similar to, to the work that I'll be covering um, is this paper by Montufar and all in 2014, uh, which talks about the number of linear regions for, for deep neural networks. So one point to first, first consider is this idea of linear regions to, to measure expressivity. Um, so, so how does this all fit in? Well, uh, quick recap of modern neural network architectures. They're, they're much more complicated than this, but <laughs> the general structure is similar, where we have some input layer of neurons, and then we have multiple hidden layers, also consisting of neurons, and, and we have some output. And um, importantly, all of these neurons have activation functions, nonlinear activation functions. Um, probably the most popular activation function used in practice today is this ReLU activation function, uh, which treats which goes to zero if, uh, if x is negative and is sort of just uh, equal to x if x is positive. Sometimes we also see saturating nonlinearity, such as sigmoid or tan h. Um, this is often comes up in uh, NLP tasks. Um, and for the purposes of this talk, we'll be thinking of this piecewise linear approximation to them, um, which we call, say, hard tan h. OK, so this is the structure of, of modern neural networks. Um, and one very simple observation is that Neural networks that have piecewise linear activations uh, compute overall a piecewise linear function on the input. What does this mean? Well, we can, we can actually just picture this. So let's suppose our input is two-dimensional. Um, what this means is that I can chop up my input space into a bunch of different regions. 
And each one of these regions has a different linear function that's acting on it. So maybe if I'm in this sort of top corner here, I've, I've, my neural network acts on x by multiplying by some matrix A1 and adding some term B1. Uh, maybe over here, it's some matrix A2 and, and B2 instead. But all of these regions correspond to different linear functions uh, that the neural network uses to perform its computation. And so having seen this picture, the natural question, of course, is how many regions are there? So to solve this problem, what we're going to have to try and do is, is relate a picture like this, a picture of input space, somehow to what our neural network actually looks like. Uh, and luckily for us, there's a very natural way we can do this. Uh, and this comes by a, a, a concept we call activation patterns. So what's an activation pattern? Well, let's revisit our neurons, which have uh, different nonlinear activation functions. Um, so say some of them have ReLU activations. Um, so for a certain input, our neuron is going to be in some part of this ReLU activation function. And we can color it blue or call it off if it's in the, the negative part. Um, and we can color it red or call it on if it's in the, the positive part. And if we do this for all the neurons in a network, for a fixed set of weights and for a certain input, we get a certain activation pattern. Now, if we vary our input, uh, we'll get a different activation pattern. And thinking about these activation patterns gives us a very natural way to upper bound the number of linear regions that a neural network might give us. So in Montufar and all, uh, they give the, the kind of <clears throat> the, the obvious upper bound almost of two, two to the number of neurons, because if you're thinking of neurons as on and off, then two to that number is the total max number of activation patterns you could possibly have. Now, this is a little unsatisfying because as we're going to see, not all activation patterns are simultaneously achievable. And also, this two to the number of neurons doesn't really tell us how different properties of the network, say the depth or the width, might come to play in this bound. <clears throat> so how can we do better? Well, let's start off by thinking about shallow networks. So we've just got our inputs, and we've got one hidden layer. Yeah? This? Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, so I guess in this case, we're not really considering dropout. We're just considering like the functional, like, like, like if you have a neural network architecture with a certain structure, um, what, what that means for the, the like amount of regions that can be induced, probably without dropout. If you have dropout, then you'll have like some subset of like linear regions that'll be induced because you're killing some of the neurons. But um, yeah, that could be kind of interesting to, to look at further. Um, but for now, so, so let's just say um, we're considering um, um, shallow neural networks. So what's happening is our input x is being fed into this network. It's, uh, it's interproducting it with this weight, and then it's adding this bias. And whether this equation is 0 or not gives us a boundary of whether this neuron is going to be on or off. And so if we consider all of the neurons it, to, together, um, the central question um, becomes, what's the maximum number of linear regions uh, that we get when we have k hyperplanes, that's, the, that's our k number of neurons uh, in, in m dimensions. And that's, that's the dimension of our input. And it turns out that this is a standard question in the theory of hyperplane arrangements um, and uh, is, is proved in Zaslavsky's theorem uh, using this, this notation of a lattice. Uh, we also prove it independently from first principles in our paper. Um, but the important point is that this, there's a nice upper bound for this central question, uh, which is given by the sum of these binomial coefficients. And in fact, this bound is tight, and it can be achieved if the number, if all of the hyperplanes are in general position. So nothing's linearly dependent with each other. So what does this mean? Uh, this means that we've actually solved this question uh, for shallow neural networks. So that's exciting. But uh, we really wanted to think about deep neural networks. So how do we go from here to, to deep neural networks? Well, it turns out you can iterate on this to, to get the, 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 upper, the final upper bound for, for deep neural networks. And we can do this like so. So let's go back to our two-dimensional input case um, and say we have just four hidden neurons in this, in this first hidden layer. Well, we've just said that the on-off boundary for each of these neurons is a hyperplane, and we're just in two dimensions, so it's just a line. And we have, so we have four lines in input space that have divided everything up into, into these regions. Things get more interesting when we add our next layer. Um, now for this second layer, 
in a region that's already defined by this first layer, we've just got some linear function of our input. And so again, we're back to this setting of where we just have hyperplanes that are dividing up this region that's, that's defined by this first layer. But if we cross a boundary that's defined by the first layer, then suddenly the neurons that are on or off changes and we have a nonlinear switch from the input coming in here to the input coming in here. And so we get another hyperplane arrangement here, but you can see that they can bend at the boundaries. And this, this, this is the case for all further layers we add. So for the third layer, say, uh, we, get, we can bend at any boundary defined by uh, regions that are defined in the first and in the second layer. And putting it together, this lets us compose the bound that we came up with for the, the, the first layer uh, for every single region that we get. And finally gives us a bound of sort of order uh, k to the mn, where k is the width of our network, m is the input dimension, and we're thinking of it as sort of a constant, and n is the depth of our network. So we can see that there's this depth width difference. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. it's, it's zero or real number, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so the motivation for that is like, you're totally right, it's zero or, or a real number. Um, but like from zero to the real number, you switch linear segment. And what we're really interested in is counting the number of different linear functions you get. And so you can, you can kind of do that by just seeing how you switch from one linear segment to another linear segment. Um, and so that tends to like zero and, and like kind of zero and non, not zero sort of division. Yeah, so, so if you're talking about leaky values, this would, this would definitely hold for leaky values too. And you can do this for any piecewise linear function. So I briefly mentioned hard tan each, but yeah, anything piecewise linear, you can apply this kind of argument to. Uh, the numbers will change slightly depending on like the pieces and the number of pieces you have, but yeah, broadly this argument works. Um, so, so we end up with this bound for deep networks. There's a more exact version in the paper. Um, and the bound is tight for m equals one, but for larger m we suspect it's loose, so there's more work to be done there. Uh, there's been some very recent work that's also looked at uh, tightening this bound for, for different values of m. Okay, so we've, so now we've, we've gotten part of the way there. So we've, we've derived this upper bound of expressiveness for, for our neural networks, and we've seen how the depth and the width uh, affect it in different ways. Uh, but really, we'd like to move on to actually uh, making measurements on, on real neural networks, on the kinds of neural networks people use and, and train today to gain more insights. Um, now, one problem we run into is even for the smallest tasks people consider in practice, that might be, say, MNIST, uh, with an input dimension of 784, um, that's, that's still too big an input dimension for us, for us to do something like enumerate the entire space and, and sort of see exactly how our network behaves everywhere. So we have to make some kind of approximation. And the question is what kind of approximation to make. And, and one natural approximation seems to be to consider a, a lower dimensional trajectory that lets us explore different parts of input space and where we can take sort of a sample of the kinds of, uh, the, the kinds of computation our network is performing. So what's a low-dimensional trajectory? Uh, so let's go with a one-dimensional trajectory. A one-dimensional trajectory is just a, a curve in our input space um, that's parametrized by this one-dimensional parameter t um, in 0 and 1. And this is something that's very familiar to all of us. Uh, so a line would be a one-dimensional trajectory. Uh, a circular arc would be a one-dimensional trajectory. And even, even something that doesn't have a nice closed form but sort of satisfies this property would be another one-dimensional trajectory. And so very quickly, we can kind of take these sort of measurements using these one-dimensional trajectories. Um, there are a lot more results like this in the paper, and we can sort of see the differences that we, uh, between depth and width in the, the effects of these measurements. Uh, but even more interestingly than that, when we started looking at taking these measurements, uh, we discovered something very interesting, uh, which is that the depth of the network has a direct effect on the length of the trajectory that we pulse through it. So suppose we start with, uh, with some trajectory, uh, and we're, and we're keep keeping track of it, uh, its image as it goes through the network in all of these latent spaces, we see that, it length, that its length grows and grows and, and, and grows even more. 
And in fact, we can, we can prove a theorem about it. Uh, we, can, we can actually prove that if we have this trajectory going through the network, um, that the trajectory length grows exponentially with the depth of the network, with the width and the initialization scale appearing as a base. Now, one interesting thing about this, this result is that, so we proved it in the paper for, for ReLUs and for 10 Hs. Um, and these are very different kinds of nonlinearities. So ReLUs are these unbounded nonlinearities that sort of go to infinity as your, uh, as, as your input gets larger and larger. Um, and 10 H are these bounded nonlinearities. But in both of these cases, we see this growth. Um, and we suspect this growth is happening in different ways. So this is just some measurements taken from a real network where we sort of pulse a circle through. And we suspect that with the ReLUs, there's some stretching happening. Um, and with the, the 10 Hs, you're sort of increasing the curvature somehow. Um, but there's, there's more exploration here to be done. <clears throat> now, what about the effect of training on trajectory length? So we can also measure this. Um, and we tried training a convolutional network on, on CIFAR-10 um, and seeing how the trajectory changed with training. Um, so over here on the x-axis, you have the, the, the actual layer going from input to output. And then on the y-axis, you have trajectory length in log scale. Um, and these red lines here are what the network looks like at the start of training. And the, the blue and purple lines, what it converges to at the, the end of training. So we can see there's this huge growth in trajectory length. And the interesting thing is that this is observed even if we initialize the network with a contractive initialization. So the weights are initialized to something that might slightly shrink your, your length as you go through the network, and also with L2 regularization. Um, so, so even with some weak L2 regularization, we see that this growth happens. Now, one thing you'll see is that the, the title of this plot has trajectory growth without batch norm. Um, and that's because I'm going to compare it to the effect of adding batch norm. So batch normalization um, are these layers that you add to your neural network that uh, help shift and scale your, your hidden representation. Um, and they're shown with these dotted lines in this plot over here. And what we see, so in this plot, the, the red curve is the, the fully trained network. But what we see is that the batch normalization really pulls down the, the length of the trajectory uh, as, it, as it goes through the network. And so with this observation, our question was, of course, whether we could regularize directly on trajectory length and see whether that has a similar effect to, to batch normalization. And what we do is very simple. Uh, instead of get, having batch normalization layers, we add trajectory regularization layers. Um, and at each point, we take a ratio of the current length of our trajectory with the original length and multiply it by some regularization constant that we add to our, add to our final network loss. Uh, the one nice thing about this setup is that batch normalization has a weird difference between train time and test time. Um, at train time, you're keep accumulating uh, samples from like your mini batch um, or certain statistics like the mean and variance from your mini batch. Um, and then at test time, you're using this accumulated average. And sometimes that can be a bit fiddly to play with. Um, but with this, the, the behavior is the same at train and test time. So, so that's kind of nice. Um, and the way we compute trajectories in practice is also actually the simplest possible thing we could do, which is suppose we have a mini batch of four points, uh, then we just take our trajectory length to be the pairwise distances between them. And even though this is uh, like horribly crude approximation to, to the, sort of the real trajectory, uh, it, still, it still works reasonably well. So it takes us a little longer to converge, but our green line here shows, uh, matches the performance of what we get when we have batch normalization layers. So, so far, we've seen the effect of depth and width in inducing nonlinearity in our network in, in partitioning our input space to the number of linear regions. Um, and we've also seen how the network shape uh, directly affects properties of the hidden representations uh, via, via this trajectory length. And the nice thing is from this latter insight especially, we can, we can try and derive a, a new regularization method that seems to have a similar function to, to batch normalization. Now, one thing that's, that's important to point out here is that we study trajectory length as some kind of sort of summary statistic of our latent representations. Uh, but of course, this doesn't have to be the only, the only summary or only interesting property of our latent representation. And maybe another interesting property is seeing how our latent representations converge. And for that, we're going to be using correlation to gain insights into how these representations converge to their final state through training. 
So this brings us to the learning dynamics of deep neural networks. Um, and most of this work is um, based in our paper, FBCCA, uh, that appeared at NIPS last year. So the goal is to try and understand how a network converges to, to its final um, representation, including how this happens in the hidden layers. Um, now, um, this problem actually hasn't been that extensively studied in the literature, but the, some of the prior work that we could find on it uh, typically does this by looking at how the weights move. Oh, is that, it? okay, no. <laughs> um, so, so you're seeing, so the weights are having all these gradients updates happen, and you're trying to see how those change as, as the network trains. But the problem with doing this is that we can have a large magnitude change in the weights. That doesn't necessarily mean that our network is learning a wholly different function. In fact, its output might be quite similar, and you might not be changing things very much. Uh, so we thought it really made sense to try and look directly at the feature maps or the latent representations learned by the network and, and use that as our, as, our, as our object to study and see how that evolved to its, to its final state. And to do this, we introduced a, a very simple formalism. Um, and this is actually, it's, it's a pretty obvious formalism. Um, but say we have a neural network and we're uh, feeding it some data points, x1, x2, and x3. Well, we can ask what a hidden neuron does in this neural network when it sort of sees these inputs, x1, x2, and x3. Um, and the answer is the most obvious thing, of course. It just emits these scalar values, z1, z2, and z3 for x1, x2, and x3. Now, getting rid of the puppy pictures um, and adding more symbols, say we have inputs x1 to xm, um, then same sort of thing. Our hidden neuron emits these z1, z2, all the way to zm. And we can take all of these zi and stack them to form a vector. And this vector is the activation vector of the neuron over the specific data set x. And this, this activation vector tells us something about uh, the kinds of inputs that are exciting this neuron, how, how much it's activating in response to them, and so on and so forth. Of course, there's nothing special about that specific neuron, and we can do this for any neuron in our network. So say we look at a certain layer, we get these uh, high dimensional vectors z1, uh, which sort of sits here, z2, z3, z4, say, which sit in this high dimensional space, uh, dimension being the number of inputs we get, um, and, and tell us something about the kinds of feature maps that these, these neurons are learning. Okay, so we're representing our neurons by these vectors, now what? Well, the output of neurons gets linearly combined and uh, gets mapped to the next layer. And so, if we have a data set with m examples and we're thinking of neurons as these activation vectors sitting in this high dimensional space r to the m, uh, then it's natural to think about layers as subspaces that are spanned by their neurons because we're doing this linear combination. And so that's really the summary of our formalism. We're thinking of neurons as vectors and, and layers as subspaces. Um, and that brings us to the method we use to analyze them, uh, which you call SCCCA, Singular Vector Canonical Correlation Analysis. Uh, it's quite a mouthful, um, but, um, but it's hopefully pretty straightforward. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with um, singular value decomposition or canonical correlation analysis, I'll review those in just a sec. Um, but for now, um, the algorithm works as follows. So we input two set of neurons, U and V, um, and you can think of these two sets of neurons as typically being layers of your neural network. Um, and we have a step one um, where we apply singular value decomposition to, to U and V. And, and step two, which is really the main step, um, is we apply canonical correlation analysis on the SVDs of U and V. Step one is in some sense optional. It's, it's a step that we took to help reduce computation. So after you perform a singular value decomposition, you can get rid of some of the singular vectors that don't have that high singular values and, and reduce the amount of uh, things that you have to analyze. Uh, but really, the, the crucial part for comparing representations is canonical correlation analysis. And doing that will just work. So what's the output of this? Well, the output of these are these aligned directions, ui and vi and these coefficients rho i that tell us how well correlated ui and vi are. So as an example, um, suppose we input two sets of neurons that had absolutely nothing to do with each other. Uh, then as output, we'd get these ui and vi, which would be these directions, but they wouldn't be very well aligned. And we'd expect that these correlation coefficients rho i would actually be very close to zero. Uh, on the other end of the scale, if you just input two copies of U, then the aligned directions you get out are going to be perfectly aligned, and you'd see that your correlation coefficients are going to be very close to one. Well, it should be exactly one. 
And um, one quick note is that the code for all of this is open source. So um, if you're interested in this and would like to check it out further, uh, definitely check out the GitHub page. OK, so before moving on, a quick recap of singular value decomposition and canonical correlation analysis. Um, so singular value decomposition is really answering the question, what directions best explain the variation in the data? So if your data looks like this, then we can see that along this axis, uh, there's a lot of variation. And so our first singular vector would probably point along that axis. Canonical correlation analysis is also a different question. Uh, it's asking us how similar uh, two subspaces are to each other, really. And, and these subspaces are represented by, say, in our case, a set of neurons or vectors, u and v. And it answers this question by finding pairs of directions that are maximally aligned to each other. So say our, our u consisted of two neurons that maybe you know, went up to 1 and was 0 here and then went up to 1 again, and then something that went up to, say, 10 and was 0 in these places, and v consists of uh, two other neurons that look sort of similar, then our first CCA direction uh, might, say, add both of these together because there it's clear we get the, the same representation. So um, we're going to touch on more of this later, but uh, CCA has some very nice invariances that lets us apply it naturally to analyzing uh, how similar representations are in neural networks in, in many cases. Um, but the first case we look at is, is a pretty straightforward one. It's, um, it's learning dynamics. Um, so what do we do for learning dynamics? We typically take uh, two snapshots of a neural network during training. Uh, one of them is somewhere midway through training at some time t. And one of them is typically at the final time step. And we want to know how similar these, rep how close the representations at time t are to the representations at time, uh, to time capital T, the final time step. And so we can look at a certain layer. And we can look at the same layer at the final time step. And we can just apply SVCCA to these latent representations to see how similar they are. Now, one nice thing about uh, SVCCA is that it isn't restricted to just comparing the same layer with itself. Um, and we can actually use this to do every single pairwise layer comparison possible. So we can compare this layer with some other layer in the network. Um, and in fact, what we do is we compare all pairs of layers with each other, and we summarize their similarities into, into a single number uh, to give us these pain-like plots. So this is for a convolutional network trained on CIFAR-10. And um, along the x-axis, you have an index of uh, layers from input to output. And also along the y-axis, starting at the bottom, you have input to output indexes. And this, this, this network is being compared to itself at its final time step in training. And so you can see this nice uh, yellow diagonal that's appeared here. And that's because you're comparing each layer with a copy of itself. And of course, they're perfectly correlated. What's sort of interesting is you can recover interesting aspects of the network structure from this also. Uh, so we have these two by two blocks here. And these two by two blocks are caused by batch normalization layers, uh, which representationally are identical to the, to the layers before them. And more, more generally, we can kind of do this for, for any network as we go through training. And so this is for a convolutional and residual network that we trained on CIFAR-10. And another thing, another maybe interesting thing to note is that for the residual network, for example, uh, we see these kind of grid-like patterns come up, and that's the effect of the residual connection coming in, which suddenly makes things more similar to its previous representations. And we can also sort of see these three distinct blocks, and that's because the network is organized in these three distinct blocks. So even looking through these pain plots, we get some insights into what the network looks like or how it's, how it's performing its computation. But uh, a high-level takeaway from this, maybe, is that the lower layers, especially the lower convolutional layers, uh, seem to converge much faster than the, than the intermediate convolutional layers. And we can see this even more clearly in a per-layer plot, where these darker lines correspond to the lower layers, uh, where lower here means closer to the input, by the way. Um, and these lighter lines correspond to the, the higher convolutional layers. And we can see this clear difference in how long it takes them to converge. And so if that's really the case, uh, that suggests something very obvious and simple to try when training a neural network. And we call, this, we call this freeze training. So typically, when you train a neural network, you do a forward pulse. You feed in a mini batch of data. You look at its outputs. You see how accurate you are. And then you update all the weights of all the layers uh, according to your gradients. But if the lower layers really are converging before the higher layers are, Maybe you don't need to keep doing this for the lower layers all the way through training. 
So at time zero, just t0, you, you sort of start off by training as normal. You do your forward pulse and your full backward pulse. Um, but at time t1, uh, you can then freeze the first layer. So you no longer have to update its weights because you suspect that it might have converged by then. And at time t2, you freeze the first two layers, uh, and then sort of so on and so forth. You go through uh, consecutively freezing layers in the network, which you think have converged. Now, the nice thing about this is it's computationally cheaper. Uh, you don't have to update gradients all the thing. But the thing you mentioned about with vanishing gradients, that, that's like a separate problem. So you just have to make sure that like, your gradients are well conditioned, and you'd probably just be monitoring like, your gradient value, say, during optimization, and provided they were some like, non-trivial, non-zero value, then you know you're getting gradient information. And then if it's still not moving, or like, it's still representationally, it's still similar, that would suggest that you've learned what's useful. Um, yeah. Yeah, so if you measure absolute values, things tend to like sit there oscillating. Um, but like the oscillation is mostly just noise. Like it's not really adding much to the, to the performance. Um, yeah, so, so two things I wanted to touch on really quickly um, before I moved on. Um, so, so with this SVCCA technique, we've so far mostly focused on learning dynamics where we've compared one network with itself. Uh, and I'd mentioned that SVCCA, or particularly CCA, has some very nice invariances um, that let us uh, be very flexible about the kinds of comparisons we make. And in fact, one of the really nice invariances it has, because it's really thinking about things as subspaces, is a permutation invariance. So if you have, so one issue that people often bring up with, with neural networks or one natural symmetry is, Say we take a fully connected layer, uh, then you know there are two. There are any any fully connected layer can be permuted and still have the same representational capacity, um, and this becomes a real problem if we want to say compare two networks over two different training runs or maybe even over different data sets. Because how do we know that we they've learned things in the same ordering? Well, we don't, and so whatever method we use has to be invariant to this. Um, Luckily, CCA has this very nice property, uh, so we can do this thing. So we, so there are more plots of this in the in the paper, but we can actually compare, say, two different networks. In in this case, uh, just they have the same architecture, but we've done two different training runs on the same CPAR10 data set. So so first, it's like useful to visualize what what this actually maybe looks like. Um, and so here we see uh, four rows. And um, along the x-axis, we actually have a secret index over the data set. So think of x1 to xm sort of being along here, uh, sorted into classes. And along the y-axis, you have the actual uh, va value of the neuron, the value that it's emitting um, on, this, on this particular input. And so on the red here, we have uh, two neurons from the f our first network that we've trained on CIFAR10. And in the green, we have two neurons uh, from the second network that we've trained on CIFAR10. Um, of course, I'm only showing two neurons for each network, and we can look at, but even if you look at many more neurons, one thing you'll note is that it's not at all obvious that these are uh, solving the same task at all. And so there are like maybe two possible cases. Case one is that they've genuinely just learned something completely different, but somehow are still managing to do well on the same task. And option two is that there is some hidden similarity between them that requires alignment. And, and we'll suddenly see that things are actually more similar than they maybe appear looking at single neurons. And the latter definitely turns out to be the case because it turns out we can align them pretty well when we apply uh, CCA to them. So over here, um, we have the first pair of aligned directions for both of the network and the second pair of aligned directions for both of the network. Um, and we can see now that actually there's a lot of latent similarity and we can recover this when we, when we do this alignment. Um, both, both for, say, the first direction and the second direction. Another cool thing that comes out is these dotted lines are the different class boundaries. And we can see that when we do this alignment, uh, these, these neurons are sort of firing sort of according to classes. So at this point in the network, in the first fully connected layer, uh, we're seeing that uh, the neurons have all, there are sort of common shared representations that have already become well aligned to classes. One cool thing is that this also remains true lower in the network. So if you go lower down to some of the convolutional layers and also try this kind of alignment, you'll often see neurons fire uh, sharply for something that broadly looks like it's in one class. So, so more, more on this in the paper. We also try comparing convolutional networks to, to residual networks and, and so on. Um, finally, um, I also wanted to touch on one other insight we got from applying SVCCA, which was network compression. So we suspected that when you have many neurons in a layer, say 1,000 neurons, 
um, that maybe we don't need all of these neurons for, for good performance on the task. And then the question becomes, can we find some subset of neurons or some projection we can apply to the neurons uh, where, where, where we can have a much smaller set of directions or dimensionality than the original amount uh, and still see that we get good performance? And, the, and our hypothesis going into this was that, so from the previous, from the previous slide, we've seen that we can successfully align uh, two networks trained independently on the same task. And we suspected that if there were things that were common in the representation to both of these networks, they must be critical to the, to the task it was working on. Because if it's had to relearn it twice, then chances are you have to keep relearning this thing to, to do well at the task at hand. And so we use this as a guide, and we project, uh, we, we project the hidden representation onto the top SBCCA directions. And so we just do this offline after training. We just project and then look at, and look at performance. Um, and I have a plot in the paper of doing this for CIFAR 10, and we can compare it to uh, random, picking random neurons or picking neurons with highest activations. But um, one, th one cute thing I wanted to show here is a little visualization of what this actually looks like. So here's a small toy network that's regressing on a bunch of functions. And we can take one of the hidden layers, and if we project onto the top two SBCCA directions, we are already recovering some things of like the biggest amplitude, um, and then projecting on the top six uh, like gets you pretty close. And by the time you get to the top 30, you're, you're actually looking very, very similar to the output, which relied on 200 neurons. So this is just a, this is just a cute description of what it looks like in the output. Um, and in the paper, we have sort of comparisons doing this compared to random neurons and so on on CIFAR 10. Um, so um, finally, um, for, for those of you who are like theoretically inclined, um, there's some important theory that I've skipped here, which is uh, talks about how we apply SBCCA to convolutional layers. Um, the, the setting I described um, doesn't naturally translate, but there's some very beautiful theory involving the discrete Fourier transform that does let us extend this here. Um, and all of that and the theory and the demonstrations are in the paper. Um, and so um, yeah, do check it out and check out the code too if uh, that's of interest. Okay, so I guess I have 10 minutes left or? Okay, <laughs> approximately. Um, so I think, I, think I, will, I think I have time to do uh, a final section um, where I quickly want to touch on reinforcement learning. Um, so deep reinforcement learning has been in the news a lot lately. Uh, even for a subfield of deep learning, I'd say it's getting a lot of limelight. And we've heard about all of its fantastic successes from AlphaGo and Self Play to progress on video games, be it Dota or Atari, uh, and also some of the pr progress on end-to-end -end robotic learning. Um, but all of these successes tend to hide uh, many of the challenges uh, that you face as a deep learning, as a deep reinforcement learning researcher, or some of the the lack of consistency and reliability in the results. Um, and so here's, here's, a, here's one of my favorite examples of these. Um, so over on this side here, you can see a standard deep reinforcement learning benchmark task, the Haas cheetah task, where you're trying to teach this bipedal creature to, to learn how to run. And your reward is just how fast, it, how, how, how fast it's going. And over, over on the left here, you can see that here are some performance curves of us attempting this task. Um, and most of us would look at these curves and say, yeah, the orange curve looks like it's doing better than the blue curve. But the problem is that between the orange curve and the blue curve, uh, the task is the same, and the model is the same, and the algorithm is the same. And in fact, the only thing that's different is the random seed that we use to train. <laughs> so so this, is, this is from an excellent paper called Deep Reinforcement Learning That Matters, which I'd highly encourage everyone to check out. Um, and so, so this is the demonstration in the paper, but actually we don't even need the paper. Uh, we, just tried this, we just tried out this demonstration uh, j just to see how to work. And so this is us training the same task on two random seeds. So on the bottom here, it learns how to run, but over here it sort of flips itself upside down, doesn't know how to get back up. And so, so, so it learns this sort of weird backward gait. So, and, and there, there's, there's another problem with reinforcement learning, uh, which, which one of my <laughs> co-authors made, but um, it's, the only, it's the only setting in machine learning where you train on the same thing that you test on. You, you train on some environment, and your, and your success is measured by the reward, the, the highest performance that you can actually get on that environment. 
But that environment doesn't typically change between train and test time. So, so what are you really achieving? And you know, can we actually do, can we do better than this? Um, there is one challenge here, which I'll come back to, which is that often a priori, it's hard to know whether just because, whether if you switch something from train and test, wh whether you change your environment from train and test, whether a similar sort of optimal policy can be found, or whether whether things will transfer. Uh, but we find a way to to actually address this. Okay, so so deep reinforcement has a lot of problems, and is there is there some way that we can think about addressing these challenges? Um, and one thing that became clear to us after thinking about this for a while is that. It would be really helpful to have a, a new kind of testbed environment, um, a testbed environment where we knew what the optimal policy looked like um, as a neural network, and maybe also what the latent representations looked like as a neural network. And, and then it might be very easy to debug and, and understand the, the variability in performance. Anytime we could train, train a model on this, train an agent um, on this environment, see, actually see what it learned, compared it to the optimal, and then try and diagnose the kinds of mistakes it was making um, and the difference between uh, different training reruns, et cetera. Uh, another kind of important point that would come out of this is that we could measure generalization, which I've mentioned is tricky. How do you tr change your train environment so that the thing you learned in your train environment still makes sense in the test environment, uh, but is also a good enough measure of, of learning better abstractions than, than just overfitting? And so to do this, we, we turn to, turn to a, un, a, a rather different direction than maybe typical. Uh, we turn to a, a family of combinatorial games um, that were made by Joel Spencer uh, and also built off of the work of um, Paul Erdős and John Selfridge. Um, and we call these the Erdős selfridge spencer games. And these games have two very nice properties. Uh, the first property is that there's this closed form solution. This is the, the first thing I was describing. We know what the optimal policy looks like as a neural network, and, and we even know what the, the latent representation should look like. The, the first game we consider in this family actually can be represented by a linear network. Um, and the second property that also made it nice is it has these natural difficulty par parameters that we can vary and, and then see how performance uh, changes as we do this. So, what is this game? Well, we call it the attacker defender game. Well, one of these games is called the attacker defender game. Um, and the, the game sort of, uh, the game setup is as follows. Um, there are k plus one levels from, from zero to k, um, and there are n pieces uh, set in all of these levels. Now, the attacker is trying to get at least one piece to level k, and the defender is trying to destroy all of these pieces before this happens. So this is sort of like an inverse space invaders, if, if any of you have played that. And so per move, what happens is that the attacker presents the defender a partition of all the, gate, of all the pieces that are currently in play. So partition um, in, say, two sets, A and B. And the defender gets to destroy one of these sets, but all of the other pieces in the other set all move up a level. So it's really about deciding, trading off um, between A and B as to what set should be destroyed to try and stop the attacker from, from advancing. Um, the nice thing about this game is that there's a natural potential function uh, that basically the potential function just lets us accurately measure the size of sets A and B, or rather how dangerous they are. So if we get a set A and B, we can sort of feed them into this potential function, and it'll tell us which one is more dangerous. And directly off of the potential function, we can immediately derive the, what the optimal policy looks like for the defender. And we can also uh, highlight um, conditions that will guarantee a win for the attacker and will guarantee a win for the defender, provided they play optimally, of course. And with this setup, we can you know, build this environment. We can train some of our popular reinforcement learning algorithms on it on varying sets of difficulty and see how they do. Um, our conclusion from this was that aside from the easier difficulty settings, RL isn't very good at learning the optimal policy or necessarily being particularly stable. These shaded, um, this, this shaded area in the plots show you the variance you see, and, and there's usually quite a lot of variance in, in performance. But more interestingly, maybe, uh, this also gives us our first attempt at actually measuring how RL algorithms might generalize. Because there's a very natural way that we can change our environment here and still ensure that the things we've learned at train time matter to test time. Because we know that there's an optimal policy, and that optimal policy holds over any game configuration or any way you make the, make the agents play. And so 
So one simple thing to do is that we can vary the opponent's strategy. So we start off in this paper by just training a defender agent. So the attacker is sort of playing procedurally and a little randomly to give the defender good training data. And the defender is learning how to pick between these sets A and B. And we can change how the attacker plays at train time to how the attacker plays at test time. And if the defender is really learning the right principles, it should perform just as well. Of course, that's not what happens. And we see, we see a significant generalization gap in how the defender performs at train time, which is this sort of blue curve here, um, versus test time. Uh, this is for different difficulty settings of the environment. So everything's going down because the game's getting harder. But, but we can see that there's, especially as the game gets even harder, there's a, there's a big generalization gap here. The good news is that we also found uh, training uh, paradigms that would help address this. Uh, so in particular, so far, we'd only looked at training a defender agent. Um, and that's because training an attacker agent uh, is not an easy thing to do. Uh, and we had to come up with more theory that would let us actually do this. But after we trained the attacker agent um, and then had both of the agents learn against each other, we found that this really helped with the defender's generalization when we varied attacker strategy. And then finally, um, self-play has been in the news a lot lately. And so this is also something we really wanted to try and, and benchmark performance. Uh, but it's not clear at all how you do self-play in this, in this environment, uh, because the action space for the attacker and the defender are completely different. So quick recap, self-play is when you have one neural network that represents both, in our case, both the attacker and the defender. Um, and, and, and you're just using that to like, suggest what actions to take. But in this case, the attacker has to pick these sets, well, it has to define these sets, and the defender has to pick which one to destroy. Um, but we managed to find a way to get self-play to work uh, by realizing that both the attacker and the defender are really trying to learn the size of a set of pieces. So we can actually, so, so this is actually pretty similar to the kind of algorithm to, that, um, that AlphaGo Zero uses. So this is the self-play uh, bot for playing Go, um, which is that they don't just use pure reinforcement learning, but they use reinforcement learning with search. And this is exactly what we do here. We, we have some reinforcement learning, and then we add this to binary search um, and look at performance. And we got the best results here. Um, so finally, and you should look at the, the paper for this, um, but because we know the per move optimal policy, we can also make comparisons between reinforcement learning and supervised learning. Um, and we find some very interesting conclusions, uh, such that if we train with supervised learning, we're better per move. Uh, but reinforcement learning is actually still better at playing the game. So somehow it's better at paying attention to the moves that matter. Uh, we can diagnose this more specifically by looking at what we call fatal mistakes, a point at which if the agent makes a mistake, they've sort of lost the game at that point. And, and reinforcement learning is actually better at defending against these. Um, so yeah, so there is much more analysis in the paper. And so I encourage you to, to look it up. And um, I just want to say thank you to all of my collaborators. All of these papers were done with as a sort of multi-institutional and, and many people effort. And, uh, and I'm privileged to be able to work with them. Um, so thanks very much, and uh, happy to take questions.